All right, so what we're going to discuss in this lecture is um, the definition of stress, which would be slightly different from the standard definition of force per unit, uh, force per unit area. But it will be sufficiently related, let us say. So the discussion today is about stress. And we will start from the old notion of stress is force per unit area. So in general, Let's say I have a surface here, and there is a certain force acting on that surface, and that force will not necessarily be normal to the surface. So there will be some force. And that force. If we divide it by area, we expect to get a stress. So by this way, we, we would think of stress as a vector. Because force is a vector, area is a scalar, you divide a vector by scalar, you get a vector. But actually what you come what comes out of that is not stress. What comes out of that is what we call traction. So force per unit area is actually what we call traction. And it is given the symbol T, and this is force F per unit area A. Of course, assuming that the force is uniform, it is distributed. If it is not, uh, uniformly distributed, then we take the limit when the area is very small, and as such, we can write that the force on a very small area, dF, is the traction at that point times the area. So this is the definition of traction. So how do we it's very clear because we have defined stress to be force per unit area based on our one dimensional kind of tension test. So it's very clear that traction should somehow be involved in the definition of stress. But in order to understand the link between the two, it's good to take a, a very simple example. So let us here take a block of material in 2D, just to simplify things, and assume that it is under uniform tension. Like this. And let us say that we are interested in understanding the tractions at a point in the middle of the of the body here. Okay, first of all, in order to see tractions, we need to have to have we need to have a surface. Yeah. So, in order to see the traction at this point, we need to create a surface that passes through that point. And the most natural choice is to make a vertical. Partition. If we do that, we end up with the body separating into two pieces, 
the body, the left part and the right part, and they were initially in contact. So if you imagine that these bodies are separated, there is a net effect of the first body on the second one and of the second one on the first. And these effects will appear as contact forces on the interface generated by the separation of the body into two pieces or into two parts. And these are what we call internal forces. So what's going to happen is when you separate the body into two parts, there will be forces on the interface between the two, and this force will be uniformly distributed since everything is uniformly distributed. And there will be also another force acting on the left part. And these two forces, since they are an action and the reaction between two bodies, we follow Newton's third law, which says that they are same in magnitude and opposite in direction. If the total force here is F, it is not difficult to see that the total force here is also going to be equal to F, and here is going to be equal to F, in order to maintain horizontal balance. And this is also another important rule we have, is that if you have a body in equilibrium, every part of the body would be in equilibrium. So that if you separate the body into multiple parts, the equilibrium of these parts will be maintained by the contact forces between these parts and the other parts and the externally applied load. And from here, you can easily see that traction is going to be F over area, where area is the area of the vertical section, which is a concise non-zero value. Um, okay, but this is not the only way we could have cut the body. We could have also created a horizontal cut through that point. In which case, you could have cut this way. And in that case, we would have ended up with the body partitioned in a different way. And it is not difficult to imagine that there is really no need at all for the body to have any internal forces in the vertical direction. So this will be zero. So the net force acting on the interface would be a zero force in the horizontal direction because it's already balanced and the zero force in the vertical direction and uniformly applied. So in this case, the traction is equal to zero. So what this means is that at the same point, traction here is equal to a non-zero value and traction here is equal to a zero value. So we understand from this that traction, the value of traction, doesn't only depend on location. It will depend on something else. And what it depends on, it depends on the orientation 
of the cut we make at E point. Yep. So you have a point here. You can have a vertical cut, you can have a horizontal cut, you can have cuts at an angle. Of course, when you partition a body locally at a point, it will look like a plane. It doesn't look like a line if you are in 3D. It looks like a line if you are in 2D, but it looks like a surface or a plane if you are in 3D. So how do we describe the orientation of the cut? We describe the orientation of the cut using a vector, n, which is a unique vector, normal to the plane of the cut. So what we understand from here is that traction at a given point T is a function of N, which is the orientation of the surface on which we calculate the force that's passing through that point. Okay, so this is very generic. It says that traction is a function of orientation. Can we use this in order to discover more about the nature of traction in a body? And Cauchy did that in the early part of the 18th century, 19th century, and the answer came out to be quite simple. And in order to find the consequences of the fact that traction is function of orientation, he used an argument which based on a wedge in 2D or a tetrahedron in 3D. Of course, as usual, we're going to do the 2D argument, and the same will apply for the 3D argument of problem. So what he said is, let us say that we have a body under uniform traction for simplicity, and he assumed a set of axes x and y, and he created a partition of the body, he took a part of the body that looks like a wedge. And that part has one side parallel to x, one side parallel to y, and a generally inclined side. So that generally inclined side here can be in any direction. But always one of the two of the sides, two of the three sides are aligned with x and, and y. So if you look here, you will see that since the orientation of this surface is fixed, then the attraction acting on this surface, which we will call T2, is fixed. It doesn't depend on the orientation of the inclined surface. And the same goes for the attractions acting on the vertical surface, one. And of course, the attractions on the inclined surface, T, will depend on the orientation of the inclined surface. That's the variable. That's where we can see the dependence on orientation. Very well. So now the question is, what's the relationship between T1, T2, and T? That sum of forces acting on the body is zero for equilibrium. So what we do is the net force acting on the inclined part is T times A, where A is the area 
of this part here, which is in 2D is just the length of, of that part of the triangle, plus the force acting on the vertical face would be T1 A1, and the force acting on the horizontal face would be T2 A2. And this should sum out to zero force. Very well. So what we do is we divide two by area and solve for T. So you end up with T equals minus T1. And minus T1 itself is a constant. It's an, a value that doesn't depend on the orientation of the inclined surface. The value of A1 over A plus minus T2 times A2 over A. Okay, so let us say that this angle here is theta. A1 over A is just sine theta. And A2 over A is cosine theta. What are the components of N, which is a normal vector to that surface? Of course, another important rule is that whenever we are considering a body, the normal vector is always pointing out of the body. So it's the unit outward normal. So it's very clear that both components of N will be positive and it will take very little imagination to note that N has components of sine theta and cosine theta. So from there, we can write that T is minus T1, the X component of the normal vector, plus minus T2, the Y component of the normal vector, and from this, since T1 and T2 are, are constants, they don't depend on N anymore, we can write this as T as a vector being some matrix times N as a vector. And that matrix doesn't depend on N anymore, it depends on only on the location in the body that we are considering and sigma is our stress. Note that n is a vector, t is a vector, stresses relate the traction to orientation, so stress is the second order tensor which we represent by a matrix. Of course, that matrix would be 2 by 2 in 2D and 3 by 3 in 3D. Now that we know that uh, stress is actually uh, a tensor, all kinds of things uh, follow from that, but the first thing it's good to look at the Cartesian components and introduce the engineering notation for stress components. So again, we're going to do the 2D case, but then the 3D case is, is pretty similar. So let's say that you have two orthogonal axes, X and Y. So what we do is we make, take a rectangular piece of, or part of the body. Now let us look at this plane here. Yeah? What is a normal vector to that plane? Keeping in mind that 
a normal is always pointing outside the body. We see that the normal vector for this phase here is n equals 1 and 0. It is oriented along the x-axis. And by definition, the stresses which act normal on that phase is called sigma x. So this is called sigma x. And the stress which is shearing that surface in the y direction is called tau xy. So this is tau xy. Interestingly, X comes first because X defines the direction of the normal. Y comes next because it defines the direction of the force that would be generated by that stress component. What this means is that our two-dimensional stress tensor, when it is multiplied by a vector that has components 1 and 0, it should give us sigma X and tau XY. And this would mean that the first column of sigma is sigma x and tau x1. If you take now the axis, the cut here, the, this surface here, this face, which is parallel to the x-axis, the normal vector here is 0 and 1. And by definition, the normal stress acting on that surface in y direction is called sigma y. And the shearing stress, which is parallel to the surface, which is in the x direction, is called tau yx. Then from there, it's not difficult to see that the second column of the stress tensor in Cartesian components will look like tau yx and sigma y. So difficult to see that if you multiply this by normal vectors 1 and 0 and 0 and 1, you get the right uh, traction components. Remember that it's always that the first component will be along x, the second component along the and on y. So, of course, in 3D, um, we go similarly. So, you will see that your stress tensor will look first column will be sigma x tau xy tau xz. Second column is going to be tau yx tau yy, which is sigma y sigma y, and then tau yz, then tau zx, tau zy, and sigma z. So this is how the stress tensor looks in component. Okay, so if we go back to our funny little diagram here. We look at the two other surfaces of the rectangle. What about this surface here? You will see that on the left surface, what we have here is that the normal, in this case, is minus 1 and 0. Again, remember that the normal is always pointing out of the body. From here, and just multiplying sigma by n, which is the definition of traction, you find that the x component of traction is sigma x with a minus sign, which means that sigma x would be acting in this direction. And minus tau xy, which means that tau xy would be acting in this direction. And now, similarly, on this surface here, sigma y would be acting this direction, and tau yx would be acting in the opposite direction. 
And now I think it becomes clear why these um, arrows on different diagrams keep flipping. Yeah, there is nothing um, complicated about it anymore. It's very simple. It comes from the definition of tractions. So stress components map into tractions, and tractions are what generate forces. And forces are what goes into equilibrium equations. So it's actually quite uh, quite simple, the whole thing. So this is how our stress tensor looks in Cartesian components. Now, let us look at the equations of equilibrium. So in order to understand how the equations of equilibrium are derived, we imagine a body here, where this body is acted on by a combination of forces. Some of these might be on the surface of the body, and some of these forces will be acting distributed throughout the volume of the body. And these are called body forces. And body forces are usually calculated per unit volume. So at least that's how we're going to to, to deal with it. So we, if we call the body force vector V, it can change, of course, from one point to another in the body. This is force per unit volume. OK, very well. So these are the forces acting on the body. And in order to formulate equilibrium equations, we use what we have used always in this lecture, which is if a body is in equilibrium, then every part of the body is also in equilibrium. So if you want to formulate the equilibrium conditions around a point A, like this, what we do is we take a small part of the body surrounding A. And of course, we can magnify this out. So we end up with something that looks like this. And point A is somewhere in the interior of this body, part of the body. Let's just call that part P. So this is P, which part of the body. And the surface of that part, we will call it partial P. So surface of the part. So now let us look at what type of forces act on that part of the body. Once we imagine that we move that part from the rest of the body, there will be contact forces between which represent the effect of the rest of the body on that particular part. And these will be distributed on the surface. So there will be a distribution of forces which are not necessarily normal to the surface. Yeah? And there will be forces due to the effect of the body force acting on the interior of the body. So this means we have two types of forces, two types of forces acting on this part. There is the contact force, which comes from the effect of the other parts on this body. And this will simply be the integration of the traction vector times the area over the surface of the body, which is pretty much the definition of traction. Force per unit area over the surface of the body. So this will be the contact force, which should present the effect of the rest of the body on that particular part. And then we have the body force, which is simply the net force acting on the body, which is just the integration of the force per unit volume, the volume. 
So if we calculate the net force equated to zero, we get our equilibrium equation. So our equilibrium equation says that the contact force plus the body force equals zero vector. Now, all what we need to do is to replace traction by its definition in terms of stress. And then we have equilibrium equations that look like and this is the integral form of equilibrium. Okay, the nice thing about this is that it applies to any part of the body. So we can keep shrinking the size of the part P until we reach almost to a point. And in that case, we should be able, instead of having a, an integral form like this, we can have a differential form. And this can be done by using the divergence theorem to express the first integral as an integration over volume of the divergence of the stress tensor, d volume, plus and now if we shrink the size of the part of the body to almost zero around A, we can easily show that the divergence of sigma plus b is equal to zero, and this is our force equilibrium equation. This might all sound so abstract for you, so it is customary to prove this using a less mathematical way, but a bit more cumbersome. So let us go back to our um, rectangular part of the body. We have already seen that we have certain stress components. So this is sigma x, this is tau xy, this is tau yx, and this is sigma y. This direction also we have sigma y, and we have this direction tau yx, and in this direction we have sigma x, and in this direction we have tau xy. Okay, very good. Now, in the case where stresses are not uniform, and tractions as such are not uniform, the value of sigma x on each face will be different from left to right. So if it is equal to sigma x at the left, and assuming that the width in x is equal to delta x, and width in y is equal to delta y, then we can think about this as sigma as delta sigma x, this is tau xy plus delta tau xy, and this sigma y will be sigma y plus delta sigma y, and tau yx plus delta tau yx. So now let us go ahead and sum the forces in x direction. So you will get sigma x plus delta sigma x, times the area, which is in this case delta y, this is on the right face. From the top face, you will get plus tau yx plus delta tau yx delta x. Then from the left face, you're going to get minus sigma x delta y, and from the bottom phase, you're going to get minus tau y x 
delta x. The other force in y will be the force per unit volume in x direction times the total volume, which is going to be plus dx delta x delta y. For delta x is delta y is the volume. And all these sums to zero. Okay, now simplifying, we get delta sigma x delta y plus delta tau y x delta x plus b x delta x delta y equals zero. Now if we divide by the total volume, we end up with delta sigma x over delta x plus delta tau y x over delta y plus bx equals zero. If we take the limit where delta x and delta y are so small, we end up with a differential equation, partial sigma x, partial x plus partial tau y x, partial y plus bx equals zero. Similarly, if we take sum of forces in y direction, we will get partial tau xy partial x plus partial sigma y partial y plus dy equals zero. And these two will be our equilibrium equations in 2D. The 3D version you can see it in the lecture presentation. I have typed it for you there. So these are the force equilibrium equations. And if you see here, um, this is essentially, you derive the first column of the stress tensor as a matrix with respect to x, plus the second column with respect to y, plus b as a vector equals zero. And this is indeed what we mean by the divergence of the stress plus b as a the body force vector equals zero. So this here is just a concise statement of what we have on the left side. And both of them represent mathematically exactly the same thing. And this says that the sum of forces acting on the body, which are the combination of contact forces due to the stress, and the stress produces traction on the surface, when once we imagine that a certain part of the body is created from the rest of the body, and these forces plus the body forces will give us a zero net uh, force. That, of course, the simplest example of a body force is gravity. So each volume of the body, any small volume will have a mass, rho times volume, where rho is the density, and the force will be mass times gravity acceleration pointing in the direction of uh, the gravity acceleration vector, which let is called is z. So this means that force per unit volume is, in that case, is 0, 0, and rho, where rho is the uh, mass density of the material. So that's very simple. So in most cases of interest, body force will be zero, and as such, equilibrium will say that the stress tensor has zero divergence. So stress tensor is divergence-free if we don't have any body forces. Okay. What we know from mechanics is that it is not enough to uh, consider only the case where um, you equilibrate forces. Equilibrium forces is sufficient to describe the motion only if we are talking about a point mass. Once the body has finite dimensions, you have also to equilibrate moments. 
And in order to do that, we're going to consider the constant stress case because it is sufficient. So this is sigma x, this is tau xy, tau yx, sigma y, sigma y, tau yx, sigma x, and tau xy. Okay, so let us take a moment about this corner here. We see that the moments from sigma y and sigma x will cancel, and we will be left with tau xy times delta y times delta x minus tau yx times delta x times delta y. The quantity between parentheses is the force, and then the other distance is just the arm. Equating this to zero, we obtain that periodic volume tau xy minus tau yx equals zero. And in 3D, of course, we can equilibrate moments not only around Z, because the moments we have taken right now are around the Z axis. We can equilibrate moments also around X and Y. And this would give us now, if we equilibrate about x, then we will have the shear stresses that don't have x in their subscripts. So we'll end up with tau yz minus tau zy equals 0. And if we equilibrate moments around y, we end up with tau zx minus tau xz equals 0. So in general, the stress tensor will be symmetric because of moment equilibrium. Another point I, I always like to make is that it is not a coincidence that the stress tensor comes out symmetric. Because from the very beginning, we have already assumed that the effect of contact between the parts of the body is a distribution of forces, and it, there is no distribution of moments on the surface. And forces go with displacements, while moments go with rotation. So if you think about it, if we assume there are no moments, there is no point that we would have nine stress components. We should only have six of them because rotations are factored out of the picture. And this is also related to the fact that, if you remember from our strain lecture, that displacement gradient split into two parts, a symmetric part, which is strain, and an anti-symmetric or skew-symmetric part, which represented rotation. And since we have no moments, so rotations are not important for us. What is important is only strain. So corresponding to these six strain components, we have now six stress components in 3D. And these components are what really make our problem with value. On the other hand, if if that we allow moments on the surface, then we couldn't have said that what's important to describe the material behavior is only strain. So these two things are are, are related, um, and it is not really fortuitous that all these things come together at the end. Okay, very well. So right now, let us summarize what we have so far in terms of uh, analysis of stresses and strain. We have six strain components in 
um, in 3D, and in 2D we have three strain components. And in 3D we have six stress components, and in 2D we have three stress components. In 3D, we have three displacement components. In 2D, we have two displacement components. OK, so what are the equations we have in order to describe the behavior of the body? So let us consider the general problem that we are interested in, in structures. We have a body, so let's say we have a cantilever like this. And we have some loading on the body. And I'm going to assume zero body force. And let's say that the load intensity here is P. And what we want to know is deformation because this is sometimes related to the performance of the structure. For example, if you have a wing, you don't want it to bend too much or to twist too much because it will affect aerodynamic performance. The second thing, and sometimes more important thing we need to know is to figure out the stress distribution. And this is related to the fact that we as engineers think that materials fail when they reach a certain stress level. Of course, we have six different stress components. So usually we don't use all of them. We use some combination of these to define how much the material can take, for example. And this is called the failure criterion, like von Mises stress, uh, failure based on von Mises stress or maximum normal stress or maximum shear stress. But for now, we need to find the stress distribution. And based on that, we might be able, depending on whether we have a good failure criterion or not, to decide whether this structure will fail under loading or not. And a third question we always need to ask is the question of stability. Is it stable or not? And this is related to buckling analysis which we will discuss later. As far as linear theory is concerned, we can answer the first two questions, but we cannot answer the third, because stability always requires a certain amount of nonlinearity, or otherwise, it, the structure will be either always stable or always unstable. Having a stability that depends on how much loading you apply requires some nonlinear uh, elements to the problem. And this will, will take up when we go to plate and beam theory through the moderate rotation terms in strain. OK. So what else do we know in order to find deformation and stress? On the left surface here, for example, since it is clamped, we know that the displacements are zeros. So we know that displacement is zero. So we have two equations. What do we know, let's say, on the right surface here? Interestingly enough, I, I always remind people of this. Zero means nothing, and nothing also means zero. So what we know is that there is no loading applied to that surface. And this means that the traction vector on that surface is zero. And since the normal vector here is 1 and 0, the components of traction are sigma x and tau xy. So we know that 
sigma x here is 0 and tell xy is 0. On the bottom surface, again, we have no tractions, which means that the tractions are 0. Tractions on this surface in x direction are tau y x, which I'm going to write as tau x y because we agreed that the stress tensor is symmetric. And sigma y is 0. If you look on the top surface, you will see that the attraction vector is really 0 and minus p. It is 0 in x direction, minus p in y direction. And this would mean that sigma y equals minus p and tau xy equals 0. So these define our traction and displacement boundary conditions. So we have always two types of boundary conditions, either displacement boundary conditions or traction boundary conditions. All right, but boundary conditions are not enough to find the value of displacement and stress everywhere in the body. So we need equations to solve. So what would these equations be? First of all, in 3D, we have six stream displacement equations. And we have three equilibrium equations. So we have nine equations. But we have 15 unknowns. So we are missing six equations. And these six equations come from what we call the material law. or sometimes it is called constitutive law. And the constitutive law is just the, an algebraic relation that says that stress is a function of strain. So for any state of strain, we know the six components of strain, then this tells us that for this particular material, for this, these six components of strain, you have these six components of stress. A body where stress depends only on the instantaneous strain and doesn't depend on the history of strain is called an elastic body. And usually this is pretty much all what we care about. So we, most of the analysis is done for elastic bodies. Very little analysis is done for anything more complicated. Mainly because we can't really find um, solutions for problems which, are, which might be more complex than this. So more complicated stuff is usually handled numerically. So for now, we are just going to stick to the case of elastic bonds, where the stress depends, the stress at a given moment, at a given point in, in a body, will depend only on the strain at the, that same point and at that same moment. And now, this means that we will have six of these equations in 3D and three in 2D, and as such, the number of equations will be equal to the number of unknowns, and that problem may be solved. Usually, of course, we don't want to solve problems with such a very large number of unknowns, so there are two ways to go about it. Either we use displacements as primary unknowns, 
And the way we do it is we express strain in terms of displacement. Then we express stress in terms of displacement because we know it in terms of strain. And then we substitute these stresses into our three equilibrium equations in 3D or two equilibrium equations in 2D and write these equilibrium equations in terms of displacement. And this will give us three equations in three unknowns in 3D and two equations in two unknowns in, in 2D. The other possibility is to use stresses as primary unknowns. which can be done, in which case we do the opposite. So we invert the relationship between strain and displacement to express strains as functions of stress. Then, ideally, one would go from strain to displacement, but there is no way to go from strain to displacement. We can, we can always go from strain to displacement from displacement to strain, sorry, but the other way is not really all that easy. And the reason for that is that in, in, in 3D, we have six strains, but only three displacements. So how are you going to solve six equations in only three unknowns? And this is exactly the question that we raised at the end of the lecture on strains, and we said that strains, in order to correspond to given displacement, we have to satisfy what we call compatibility conditions. And these compatibility conditions we have excuse me, We had one of them in 2D, and we had three linearly independent ones in 3D. So if we substitute the strain into these compatibility equations, in terms of stresses, we're going to get either one equation in 2D or three equations in 3D. And anyway, equilibrium equations are in terms of stresses anyway, and we have two of them in 2D and three of them in 3D. So if you sum the total number of equations you would have in terms of stresses for the 2D case, you will have one plus two, which is three equations, which is equal to the number of stress components. And in 3D, you will have three plus three, which is again six, which equals the number of stress components in 3D. So these two ways we can, we can go, and in principle, they would give us the same solution. It is just a matter of convenience one way or another might be easier for a given problem. So we can use either displacements as primary unknowns or stresses as primary unknowns, or of course, and this also happens, is that sometimes we go for the full list of unknowns. So we use unknowns, strains, stresses, and displacements, in which case we try to satisfy 15 equations in 15 unknowns in 3D, or 8 equations in 8 unknowns in 2D. This covers our discussion of stresses, and then next lecture, we are going to uh, discuss um, the constitutive law a little bit more to see uh, explicitly how it looks like, and start discussing virtual work and energy methods. Uh, so we are going to state the uh, 
theorem on minimum total potential energy. And this would finish our basics uh, part of the course. And then we move on to uh, plates, beams, and shells. Uh, 